the time you get in your 40s or 50s and the relationship with, which is called marriage this romantic committed sexual thing that that people invented and one of the people aren't happy in the marriage and and what i learned is that sometimes it's the woman sometimes 60 to 70 percent of the time becomes unsettled or discontented before he does and then then he finds out that things are falling apart and this is that that gaping hole in your gut in your heart that happened to me um, we're going to talk about everything we're going to talk about the future we're going to talk about sex we're going to talk about depression and despair and recovery and relationships and steve's even going to ask me a couple of questions that um I'm going to go into some of my personal experiences in my marriage as well so Thank you guys for being here. I really hope that you enjoy this conversation um, as much as I enjoyed it and that you can, can learn from it as well. Steve, can I start by just asking you to give just a, a brief introduction of yourself um, so folks know a little bit about who you are and why you know so much about this topic? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, without taking too long because you know this could be an hour-long conversation but yeah my name is steve horseman and um it's odd because i ended up doing a lot of work with horses and trying to help men understand relationships and women everyone thought i changed my name just so it would sound good but it, it's actually my name it's spelled differently too so and and i did become one of those cliche men who got into the uh, his 20s 30s 40s and and just starting his 50th uh birthday when he found out that um, his wife wasn't happy. W what I learned about men in marriage is that we we men tend to go through life as kind of a, uh, a laundry list of to-do things. You know, you get this done. You go get a job. You make money. Get a mortgage. You know, get a riding lawnmower if you can. <laughs> get a couple of black labs and try to check off the list of how to do life. And it's kind of what we learned from the people before us, our dads. And so by the time you get the time you get in your 40s or 50s and the relationship with which is called marriage, this romantic, committed sexual thing that that people invented, and one of the people aren't happy in the marriage. And and what I learned is that sometimes it's the woman, sometimes 60 to 70 percent of the time becomes unsettled or discontented before he does. And then then he finds out that things are falling apart. And this is that that gaping hole in your gut in your heart that happened to me to me um, back in 2012 when I found out that everything I thought I knew everything I thought I created everything I thought was going to be my future suddenly was not going to be anymore and it is one of the most crushing unsettling feelings ever and I'm ch chuckling now because we use humor so much now because it's all such a cliche when we start to learn it so many men have this story and when the the story of redemption the story of reclaiming your personal power and confidence and mojo and knowing that not everything is in your control and part of our distress is because of that it caused me to create this business called good guys to great men because i saw all of us as just really good guys doing what we thought we should do <laughs> and but we, we didn't know how to be a man. And so things hit us. And there's this 13-year-old version of us that overreacts when a woman pulls away or says, I'm not happy, or I think we need space or time apart, or I want a divorce. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. It makes that 13-year-old version of our good little boy just fall apart. And what happens then is sadness, crying, anger, pleading, begging, compromising, uh, negotiating. It's just It's just a mess. And so what I found out when I got my own personal help back then in my own men's group, in my own mentor, my own coach, is that there is a way of thinking about all of this stuff at a much higher level that takes away the, the pain, that takes away the excruciating, devastating feeling that you have when you go through this. And it was so powerful. And I got a little angry that nobody taught me any of these things when I was younger. And I had to become this middle-aged guy. And... Um, but it was liberating as heck, and it made me realize that the best decades in my life were yet to come, and that is the transformation from good guy to great man. You realize that everything that's happened up to this point had to happen. It was part of the process, and it had to to get you to pay attention to the next 10 years that are going to be better than the last. And that's what I love to teach. It's what I love to talk about. That's how you and I met, obviously, and I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Um, Steve, there, like you said, that could be just a whole hour long conversation <laughs> itself right there. There's so much we could dig into. Um, but, you know, on a very simple level, 
it really sounds like what you're giving, helping your clients rediscover, giving back to them is that future. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a way of thinking about the future that doesn't have dependence on what other people do, decide what other people think, what other people um, think about you. There's a very stoic philosophy that, that revolves around being outcome independent to know that you can have goals and preferences in your life, but let's get real about what you actually control and have some grace and maturity and inner peace about the things that change that you never controlled anyway. And that's what I, I learned because we all were taught that marriage is supposed to be the ceremony that, that um, instills certainty into your life. The act of marriage, the vows and the ceremony and the witnesses all create a certainty that you'll never have your heart broken. You'll never be surprised. You'll never be devastated. And we all know there's a mathematical reality to this with divorce rates. You know, half of us don't get through that that way. And um, and so with this chuckling realization that reality is going to move whether or not you want it to, you have to decide you're going to have a relationship with circumstances that don't devastate you. And it, it does it requires a deep sense of empathy and understanding of the woman's journey as well. So you stop demonizing her feelings, her thoughts, her reactions, her prior um, childhood, everything that, that causes her to have a journey, which may lead her away from you. If you demonize it and villainize it and become a victim of it, you are pretty much doomed to another 20 years of misery. That's what I want to help guys avoid. And I love that you say that because that's how so many men start out trying to cope, right? The pain is so much, it's so overwhelming, but maybe if I can villainize her and it's her fault and she's the one who broke the vows, right? She's the one who took away the, uh, ends, the certainty. Now, somehow that makes me feel a little better now, but what actually happens over time is that then you never, you're never free from that. Yeah, yeah. And you, you see it, that a lot here on YouTube. I see that in the comments, a lot of men who are stuck in that anger and stuck in that blame. Um, yeah, for the guys listening, I, I, I never want to offend a fellow brother, but we all have to get to a point. I'm 61 now, so I laugh about some of my prior behavior and thinking that nobody was supposed to ever hurt me. Nobody was supposed to ever lie to me, cheat on me, betray me. Nobody was supposed to ever do that. And that's just ridiculous. We have no control over what the world and other people, is, even the person you married. Um, and so there's the childish part of us, a 13 year old part of it, most of us guys who, who we don't want to own the fact that life goes on and that we were responsible for either moving forward with resentment and anger and hate, or we can move forward with compassion and grace and empathy. And if you choose the first one, I guarantee you that your life will suck. So you, so I say, you better hope I'm right about this. <laughs> you better hope I'm right and you're wrong, that the hate and the anger that you've got in your YouTube comments about all women this, all women that, and all your red pill philosophy, you better hope you're not right because that that's just a recipe for a very toxic kind of um, acidic living philosophy, you know, and for guys who recover through this in a good way, there's really, really good things on the other side of divorce. There really are. Stephen, in just a moment, I want to kind of flip the focus and talk about the good things. Um, yeah. But just while we're on this topic, I just yesterday, I had a, a client ask me a question that I just... I loved because I think for so many men who are in in that place where they feel that anger and that resentment and are trying to figure out how to move past it, I think mm -hmm. a lot of them have this question. He said, well, he's like, I see that. I don't want to stay in resentment. I don't want this to take over my life. But, but doesn't she have some responsibility? Doesn't she have some responsibility to own her, her actions, her role in what happened? And it felt to him like if he finds that compassion, that forgiveness, that he's like basically saying it's okay and that she's right. And like that almost that she's getting a free pass. How do you respond to that? <laughs> that, Again, and, and that that's, you know, that is the most common question you and I get, right? Oh, when are we going to start holding women accountable for their actions and their beliefs and their blah, 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 blah. Um, as if holding other people accountable. And I'm going to get philosophical here as if it's such a thing that other people have to be held accountable. You know, 
we'll do this even driving. Oh, who's going to hold that person accountable for driving too fast? And who's going to hold that person accountable for driving too slow? George Carlin said, everyone who drives faster than you is an idiot. Everyone who drives slower is an asshole. Well, we, we tend to do this in relationships. When are we going to hold her accountable? As if holding her accountable is going to provide you any relief. The thing is that you never owned her. You don't have a title to her mind, her brain, her body. You don't have the ownership over anything. It's not up to you to hold people accountable. Now, I know being a man that all of us at that point of reckoning when we found out what was going on, it would have felt amazing to hear, you know what, I've realized that I could have been better. I wasn't honest with you. I feel so much shame and I just want to apologize. You're such a good man. I love you so much. I just can't be with you anymore. And I just want you to know that this is as much my fault as anything. And <laughs> all of the... Yeah. We, yeah, we create a movie scene of the perfectly scripted apology that would have somehow made everything okay. And it's bullshit. <laughs> it's just not true. And and so when a man understands why apologizing and admitting wrongdoing, or if it's infidelity or cheating or anything like that, and then coming forward with a genuine apology, it's very, very hard for human beings in general. And for many women, it's excruciating because they're already living in a lot of shame and admitting that they were wrong or broken or to blame is only pouring acid in their own shame. And so what men don't understand about women who fall out of love and, and become unhappy and start imagining divorce, there's a lot of pain going on that he didn't have anything to do with. And it, there becomes an empathetic view that if I really loved her, if I really loved her, I mean, really loved her, I would allow her to search whatever she needs to feel whole again, even if it doesn't include me which is the ultimate level of agape love or unconditional love. Uh, a 13-year-old boy is not capable of that <laughs> because he wants his damn apology and he wants accountability. And so good guys to great men helps us move past that boyish need and expectation that the world's supposed to say the right things to pacify us and accept that sometimes people do what they have to do for reasons that don't have anything to do with us. And when you accept that, that liberates you to be gracious uh, liberates you to have empathy and also liberates you to move on. Yeah, that's maybe the biggest piece, right? Yeah. Is it helps you let go. Um, yeah, let go. Yeah. Steve, that I love that you used the the 13-year-old boy, that that's kind of the internal part that struggles with this piece. Um, my sense from working with my clients around this is that part of that holding on, part of that trying to hold her accountable is about the future also because if she's not accountable for this well then what's going to happen next right if i really admit that i can't control any of this then that uncertainty of what's coming becomes even more daunting is that something do you feel like that's a piece of it or do you think there's it's about something else this holding on to control uh, you mean if he gets divorced and moves on if he gets divorced and moved on and if he but if he really accepts that she could make this choice that she could be yeah. in this place of pain and need to not be with him and he can't control it. The jump that I often hear is, well, then what now? How on earth now do I move into a new relationship knowing that this kind of change is, is possible? Yeah. The way I, I answer that, uh, it's also philosophical, but it's a, it's a principle that you either decide to adopt or not. And one is that we don't have any control over outcomes. We never have and never will. The other thing about relationships, especially a committed monogamous sexual relationship, whether it's marriage or just um, being together in that agreement, that there is a certain fear that we bring when we're, we're feeling insecure and immature in our body, even as 50-year-old men in a new relationship. And I got in a new one nine years ago. I had the same things like, geez, why would I do this again? And what I learned in the work that I did is that the only reason you would do it again is because you want to and you choose to trust. It's not necessarily that you tr trust her not to break your heart. You trust her to love you forever and never see you in the bad light, never to leave. You can't trust that because you have no control over that. You have to trust that you're worthy enough to be in relationship. You have to trust that you're a valuable person who has your own set of sovereignty and that if you go day to day with that, instead of worrying about the future, then you're going to be okay because your trust and your hope is in that you will feel what you need to feel. You'll decide what you need to decide. You'll respond the way you need to respond without needing to control things through fear. The fear of divorce is one of the biggest causes of divorce. 
I know that's the thing I was going to start with. I buried my lead there. The fear of divorce is one of the biggest causes of divorces because when men act fearfully, we become tyrants. We control. We become tricksters and manipulators. Uh, we become interrogators and um, oh, it's, it's compromisers. We're not authentic. We don't state what we want. We don't speak our truth. We're always trying to avoid the pain of future uh, devastation. And if you're afraid of divorce, if you're afraid to lose somebody, you can't even be with them in a loving way because everything in your brain is trying to orchestrate an outcome. It's on the defense. It's never in a loving offense, which is a giving energy instead of a prevention defense, right? <laughs> Everybody knows football knows what I'm talking about. And so the, the fear of divorce causes men to do things that cause divorce. And so what we work on is trying to help men free their mind of fear so you can be present right now. This thing you and I are doing right now at this very moment, in about five seconds, we're going to, everything's going to be good. I have to believe 10 seconds from now, you and I are going to be good. I've got no control over the next two minutes. And so all I can do is be here with you, look at you and relate to you authentically and just have faith that, you know, this is all going to work out. This thing we're doing, this podcast, <laughs> we could crash and burn, right? We have no idea, but we're here right now. And we both have faith. You know, this it's good. Let's just look at each other with the highest level of regard and grace instead of assuming that somebody's up to something. Oh. Um, that's what young people do. They assume everything's up to, everybody's up to something, trying to hurt them or yeah. persuade them. Yeah. That, I, I love that focus on that present moment, right? Because it is the only place where we can control anything. All I can control is what I do right now, and what I say and how I show up in this second. In this right moment. now, yeah. I can't, can, I can't change what I did 10 seconds ago. I can't change what's going to happen 10 seconds from now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, this is some deep stuff, isn't it? I mean, how do you just flip a switch and put your brain in that mode? I mean, that's the struggle, right? Is that this all sounds so good, this philosophical approach. Like, yeah, it sounds good. But what, I mean, it's so many of the men I talk to, it's just, they've been married for 25 years, right? 35 mm -hmm. years since they were 20 years old, like their entire, you know, really adult experience is mm -hmm. with this one partner. Mm -hmm. And then that's ending and it is so scary, right? Everything that's familiar, everything I know is, it's not gonna be that way. And everything I imagined it was going to be, all those dreams that shared future isn't going to be. Um, so yeah, that is, that is really the meat of it is the how. How yeah. do I step into and how do I get there? Um, and obviously that's, you know, you and I both know there's a process, right? That's, yeah. we both have programs because it isn't a magic flip the switch. Let me tell you in five words in this, you know, podcast yeah. or video. We know what we, the fears, the stated fears are, oh my God, how could this happen? We have so much history. What about the kids? You know, what about the money? What about the divorce math? What about what we used to mean to each other? What about our vows? What about me failing? I don't want to be a failure. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to feel abandoned. And those fears are, are, are high level fears. You and I have to work with people at a deeper place that why are you, a, why are you so afraid of being alone? Why are you so afraid of being a failure? Why are you so afraid that this will devastate your children? And so there's a fear below that, that any of us who've gone through divorce with our own parents, which I have, um, there, there's a fear of just not being good enough, which is a shame-based kind of fear. And most guys that I work with and you work with are, are successful men in the world of business and money and corporate development, entrepreneurship. I can't even say that word, entrepreneurship. They're kind of killing it. They're doing pretty well. And they've developed a set of skills and knowledge and competencies that they've become very well respected for. And in fact, they're pretty good at controlling outcomes in that world of doing stuff. And so they've come to expect that, well, I can I can control stuff here. Why not here? It's because the relationship of love with the, with another person does not follow the physics of business and, and money making. It's totally different. And that's what I have to help guys with is, is know that you've never had control and that there's a there's only one way that I know for the guys who do, do turn their relationships around and after months or years, they come back together and say, holy crap, that was intense. We learned a lot. Now what's our, what, what does our new marriage look like? 
And I love that. That's the Cinderella story I, I, I love. The only guys who get that Cinderella story are the ones who completely let go and learn the wisdom of stop grabbing on so tightly and squeezing the love out of the relationship. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, it's it's so true, but the, it's like a tragic irony, right? Is that it's in the yes. moment when you fully let go that there could be the possibility yeah. of feeling that love come back in. Yeah, well, I'll often hear wives say that it was at that moment where I first felt the most loved I've ever felt with you in our marriage that you said you loved me enough to let me go. Mm. And he swallows hard and he wants to cry and he can't believe that. Have you never felt my love before? Because most of us try to show love through what we provide and what we give, what we do, mm. as opposed to who we are being. Mm. And most people want to feel loved exactly for who they are without conditions to be fully accepted. And a lot of us go through marriage and not feeling that. And yes, guys listening, I didn't feel that for my wife either. She wasn't doing it for me. That means us humans are mostly bad at it. But the only thing I can address is my role in it, that I wasn't that great at it either. Yeah. And part of her reason for wanting to leave is to feel seen and heard and understood and connected in ways that she just wanted to feel in her body and her heart that she couldn't feel with me and didn't feel with me. I recognize my role in that. I also recognize her her childhood role in that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have the 13-year-old boy. She has the 5, 7, 10, 16-year-old woman, girl. Yeah. 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 yeah it so, took a lot of empathy for me to, to relax with the idea, to accept that what happened was supposed to happen. Yeah. What were you going to say? Nothing. Tell me more about that, because I, I think that piece for, for going into the future is so important, that what happened was supposed to happen. Um, how do you know it was supposed to happen so that, that what happened for you? Hmm. This is a choice, a, a belief system. This is an operating principle you can either buy or not buy. I'm not selling anything here. I'm just telling guys that I work with, if you choose not to buy this principle, it's a much harder road. And the principle is that I know it was supposed to happen because it did happen. <laughs> and that sounds so weird. Like, what, is, what does that mean? It was supposed to happen because it did happen. And that means because it did happen, I have the responsibility and the opportunity to respond to it in a way where I learn something. I become wiser. I become deeper. I become better. And, and I want to believe that. I want to believe that when bad things happen to good people, you don't spend a year mourning the fact that it happened. You scratch your head and go, wow, what? And I, I like to chuckle a lot because everything's funny to me. What was What am I supposed to learn from this? What, what, what am I supposed to learn? And my first epiphany was the weirdest thing is that I would teach a horse training. Um, the couple years before my divorce, I got into horse training and I was hiring horse trainers and running training clinics, reading books on horse training, crying right, at the vulnerability of horses and, and the whispering techniques that makes a horse just totally trust you and do everything you want it to do. And it will put its head on your shoulder, even when it doesn't trust other people. If you know how to relate to a horse, you'll get total cooperation and total love and respect with the horse if you know what you're doing. And I was into this crap. And then during my divorce, I realized that everything I believed in about horses, I never applied to my marriage. <laughs> Not even one. Not even one. And it was like, God, what a dope. All this stuff, these principles about pressure and, and giving and receiving and respecting and giving space and um all of that stuff, I, I did the opposite. In in my marriage, I pushed and I pushed and I pushed. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Criticize, criticize. Judge, judge, judge. Wine, wine, wine. Complain, complain. Argue, argue. <laughs> if you want to have a miserable relationship with a horse, do all that stuff. If you want to have a miserable relationship with a woman, do all that stuff. Um, and so it was this epiphany. It was a two by four in the head. Which, how did I come to be so wise about men and horses getting along and I never made the parallel to all the bad things I was doing in my relationship 
And they're not bad things. They're just expectedly immature things that I was doing when I was afraid of not getting the love and affection and touch and adoration that I craved from my wife. I thought I could force it. I thought I could negotiate it. I thought I could trick it back into existence. And the harder I tried and the harder I held on, the harder she resisted and pulled away and finally resulted in my divorce. I feel like I went off on a tangent there. No, yeah, I think you did a pretty good job, though, of coming full circle on that question because, you know, you said part of what helps you make your peace with divorce and move forward is that it was supposed to happen it was a lesson and that was the lesson i was all about lessons in horsemanship and i didn't realize that there were lessons that men are supposed to learn about relationship and love and women that nobody teaches us our dads don't teach us this which is why i, I do what i do it's why you do what you do um, and so much of this i feel like needs to just you know whether it's men or women basic relationship skills and communication and emotional process it, it's stuff we should be learning in kindergarten right but we just don't we get taught all of we really get taught all of the wrong things to do right yeah. by the example of our parents and our teachers and our movies <laughs> tv shows yeah 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 there's a very competitive model and at, at its root, competition is great in sports. I'm a competitor. I'm an ex-jock. I love I love ping pong. I like to win at ping pong. <laughs> but but you come into a relationship, there's an insecure competitiveness for attention, time, and touch, affection, is significance, respect, adoration. There's all kinds of competition. And a lot of guys will keep a scoreboard on the big wall in the living room as to how much he's been giving and how much he's been getting. And he's got a score kept all the time. He knows how many times he's asked for sex and he didn't get it. He can give you the stats on a spreadsheet, right? If not, just re repeat them from his memory. And there's, there's a competitive mode. I think we're taught early on that, especially with the gender wars and boys are stupid and girls are stupid. And we, we're kind of fed this line where we get into competition and resentment for not getting what we want. And there's a whole nother game to play. It's an easier game for men. And that's what I teach. The easier game is compassion, empathy, understanding, playfulness, right? Let's play at this. Let's stop competing. Let's just play the game and have fun together. Yeah. I, I love that piece too, the playfulness instead of the competition. Um, yeah. That brings in a sense of being on the same team and playing together instead of playing against each other. Um, Perfect. Yeah, I totally agree. Which makes me wonder now, Steve, because you were talking about the outcome, right? And we can't, we can't control the outcome and we have to let that go if we want to be at peace, if we want to be happy in this human experience. But it also does sound like you're talking about playing the game in a different way, which is having an impact on the outcome, at least as far as that relationship unfolds. Could you speak to that a little bit? Because I, I know for a lot of men going forward, that's the question, whether it's attempting to reconcile with their ex-wife or it's moving into a new relationship. What can we influence? Um, and how do you speak to men about, about that piece? is there and, and maybe it's less about influencing the outcome than it is the process but i'm curious how you would you'd speak to that um that piece yeah <clears throat> there there's a book that i really enjoy and a lot of men will read it and i'll give it the title here in a second and get an epiphany about the process of being in relationship um so many marriage counselors have have tried to convince everyone that the only secret to connecting and getting along and happily ever after is working on your communication <laughs> as if you don't know the english language well enough to communicate and it's been the biggest fallacy and the biggest reason why the success rate of marriage counseling itself is pretty darn low there's another C word, which isn't communicating or, or talking about problems and solving problems and staying in this low mood of the things are, things are wrong in our relationship. The other C word is connection. And that's what's not taught in counseling or even pre-marriage therapy. You're taught to make agreements and compromise and negotiate, right? And just kind of get along. And if mom ain't happy, nobody's happy. Really bad advice. In the book, The Relationship Handbook by George Pransky, he, he makes such a beautiful case for if two people can be clear enough, intentional enough, compassionate enough, 
to focus on connection, the relationship becomes easy. But you have to understand the deeper sense of how people feel connected. This is, goes deeper than just the five love languages. But just understanding, and I'll, I'll say this to a guy, when your wife is alone with her girlfriends, having a happy hour drink, and she's talking about you and your marriage, how do you think she talks about it? How does she represent your thinking? How does she represent your energy as a husband to other people? And he'll go, well, I don't know. I probably said, we, you know, we do the best we can. We have our ups and our downs. You know, things are good. Sometimes they're bad, but we do the best we can. And eventually we get over it. And I said, that that sounds like a low bar. <laughs> what, what would it take for her to go, what's that? Like, is that really where you want to be? Like, yeah, is that, yeah, is that your aspiration here? <laughs> That's your aspiration. I just want her to say uh, we do the best we can. Every now and then uh, a woman will show up to a, a gathering with her friends and they hate her because all of them are talking badly about their husbands behind his back. Everything that's wrong and how stupid he is. Blah, blah, blah. And they look at her and go, why aren't you talking badly? And she says, I actually really love my husband. He's not perfect, but guess what? Neither am I. And what we found out is that when we treat each other with the highest level of regard and benefit of the doubt, even drinking with my girlfriends, I want to let you know that I think highly of him and that although he's not perfect and he screws up, I want him to know that I believe in the best in him. Mm -hmm. And when he does that for me, you girls can't imagine how good the sex is. <laughs> Say something like that because there's total acceptance and it takes a really mature and a secure person to be able to live in a relationship like that. Because to do that, you have to drop the scoreboard, the competition. And that's what I tell the guy that you're talking about. This is what's possible. If you save your marriage, it's going to be done that way. If you have a great relationship after your marriage, it has to be done this way. You have to let go of all the hurts and the pains and the doubts and the fears and the skepticism and the cynicism you were talking about and start holding people in higher regard all the time, even when you don't think they deserve it. It's funny, we can do this for children sometimes. Some parents don't do it well with children. But we can do it easier with children than the object of our, our romantic love. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I find that's often an in for a lot of my clients when they're having a hard time holding themselves in high regard is to go back and visit the 13-year-old boy or the 10-year-old boy and really try to see and experience him from the outside. And I found it's almost impossible to not have compassion, empathy, and hold that child in high regard and see him as doing the best he could. Um, I like that idea when we're struggling with our romantic partners to give them that benefit of the doubt. Can we maybe look at them through that lens, knowing that it's their 13-year-old, 10-year-old, 8-year-old self um, that yeah. we're really talking to in that moment? In, in my Perfect. You just reminded me in, in my marriage, whenever my 13 year old boy, and he's still with me, guys, those of you who are listening, he's still there. We still have conversations all the time. I mean, I never know what's going to trigger him. I just have to know that when he, when it happens, he's going to go, Hey, and I'm going to go, what? <laughs> it's like, he's sitting here next to me. Did you hear what she said? Yeah, yeah, I know. So I have to father him. I have to father that little guy because he's very reactive and you don't see it coming. But what I realized um, God, I'm almost losing my train of thought. Oh, when when you when you find out that you're operating from that immature 13 year old boy space, it's impossible to give high regard. In, until you have a high regard for your own value, your own sense of worthiness, your own gift that you bring to the relationship, high regard for your own strength and your own masculine value as a father, a husband, a lover. Um, if you don't have that, you cannot give anybody else high regard. When you're hurting, it's hard to be compassionate and empathetic. That's why the work, this work, the coaching work, is to always come back to the fear behind the fear that maybe I do suck. Maybe I'm not worthy. Maybe I'm unattractive. Maybe I'm no good in bed. Maybe she just thinks that I'm not as good as the other men she's met. Um, it's this worthiness thing that you have to work on. Because as soon as you fix that, you become generous. And generosity is the, really one of the foundations of a good relationship. Give, give, not give to get, but should be a give, give competition. That unconditional, right? That yeah. I'm loving you because I'm choosing to love you and not because I want something back from you or need. Yeah. That's it's more often not that I want something back. It's I need 
that validation of my own worth back. And if I'm not getting it, then that child comes out and and guess what leads to actual sex? It's those feelings of connectedness in the emotional and spiritual intellectual realm. Um, and that's what I tell guys. That's my answer to your question. Now, let's get real. Some guys who are 35 and they still have 35-year-old level testosterone and libido, there is a total pornified performance level anxiety they have about sexuality and people liking them and getting abs and all this stuff that, that you need to do. And there is a very- If you found this video helpful, then you have to check out my free masterclass, how to take back control of your life after divorce. In that hour long masterclass, I go into way more detail than I can cover on these YouTube videos about how specifically to start to heal, to stop the painful emotions, regain your confidence and take back control of your future. I break it down into steps and give you a lot of actionable items that you can start using right now today to start feeling better. You'll find the link in the video description below under free masterclass, how to take back control of your life after divorce. I hope to see you on the masterclass and in the next video here on YouTube. Thanks for watching.